Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's on this uh, sunny but cold Sunday. Any moments of joys or concerns? Yes. Unfortunately, I have a sad news on the prayer list was Dale Moyer, and unfortunately he passed away, and his wife is now in a rehab hospital. So uh, keep her and Marie on the list, but Dale, unfortunately, can go off. Not the way any of us wanted or he planned, but uh, it got to him. So thank you. I'd like to put Tim Rayer on the prayer list. He's dealing with COVID. Right, My daughter and all. Tim, what was the last name? Rayer. G R A T E R. It's Marguerite's uh, brother in law. Other announcements? Jeff? Uh, just a reminder, please stay after church today for our congregational meeting downstairs. Please join me in our call to worship. We gather to respond to the call of God's love. Thankful that someone cared enough to share this good news with us. May we be compassionate. 
compassionate enough to share this divine presence with others. Love, when shared, is not divided, but multiplied. Love, given away, is not diminished, but expanded. May our gathering beckon and welcome those near and far to know the love of this divine presence. Deep within us, we know of a loving presence. All around us, we see glory, beauty, life, and light. We have no words for what we experience, so we cry out, God, in this moment of worship, may we that worship, may that loving presence grow deeper. May our awareness of the divine presence around us grow more intense. May we, gathered in this place, learn to pay more attention to God, who loves us all at all times and in all places. God of love and light, in this moment of prayer, be more and more in us, that we might live more and more in you. Amen. Holy One, what a blessing and privilege we share here in this sacred place and among this loving community. But like Jonah, we sometimes are jealous of what we share here. We know that others are longing and thirsting for what we know and experience. Forgive us our reluctance to open our doors, open our hearts to others, some like us, some not. We repent of our hesitations and unwillingness to witness to those we have considered strangers or even enemies for fear they just might become friends. Amen. The one who calls us to this place calls us to reconciliation through grace. God will not deny a repentant heart or an open spirit. Know that you are forgiven and walk in a new way that is made known in you in God's love. Amen. Let us praise God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people Jonah chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, 
Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning with the 29th verse. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they have none, and those who mourn as though they are not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they are not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of the world is passing away. And our gospel lesson is from Mark, chapter 1, beginning with the 14th verse. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. As Jesus, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Jonah receives directions from the Lord to go to a city called Nineveh and preach to the people there to call them to account for their sinful behavior. But instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah runs away. He gets on a boat heading in the opposite direction. It turns out that escaping God's call is not so easy. And as the story goes, Jonah ends up swallowed by a big fish. Basically, he experiences a divine time out. And amazingly enough, it seems to work. After three days, Jonah repents and prays, and the fish vomits him onto dry land. This time, Jonah does what God says. He stomps his way across Nineveh, preaching the shortest sermon ever. And what's really shocking is that it's also one of the most effective sermons ever. The people of Nineveh repent. They turn away from their sinful ways. God has mercy on them and decides not to destroy the city after all. All's well that ends well, right? Except that's not the end of the story. Because even though we usually turn Jonah's story into a cautionary tale about trying to run away from God's call, what happens at the end suggests that this story has another important lesson to teach us. So listen to these verses from the last chapter in Jonah's story. Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. 
It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? In a psychological study a few years ago, pairs of college students were recruited to play a game of Monopoly. But the game was rigged. With the flip of a coin, one of the two players in each game was assigned to be the rich player. This player got more money up front than the other player and received more money every time he went around the board. Most of the pairs figured out what was happening and, as you would expect, the rich player nearly always won the game. What you might not have expected is how this experience influenced the attitude and thoughts of the rich player in each pair. As they played, the rich players quickly began to exhibit increasingly dominant and assertive behavior, striking their pieces loudly against the board as they moved, displaying power over the poor player verbally and non-verbally, even taking more from the bowl of common snacks. The rich players also behaved more rudely toward the poor player, were less sensitive to the poor player's experience and frustration, and became more demonstrative of their own wealth and success, virtual though it was. When the game was over, the scientists interviewed the players about their experiences playing this rigged game. And at this point, everyone knew the game had been rigged. And yet, when they asked the rich players why they had won, these players talked about decisions they had made, properties they had bought, ways they had earned their success, completely discounting the fact that their success had been predetermined by a roll of dice before the game ever started. Jonah was a Hebrew, one of God's chosen people. And if God chose Jonah to be a prophet, presumably it was because Jonah had shown himself to be faithful, earnest in his desire to follow God's ways. But Jonah's faithfulness has its limits. And Jonah discovers what those limits are when God tells him to go to the city of Nineveh and tell the people there of God's love and mercy. Jonah doesn't want to go. And it turns out there is a good reason Jonah doesn't want to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the ruthless Assyrian Empire, an empire that had terrorized the Israelites. The people of Nineveh were the Israelites' sworn enemies. So it's no wonder Jonah balked when God told him to go and preach to them about God's love and mercy. For as Jonah knows, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. And Jonah isn't so sure. He wants to see Nineveh on the receiving end of God's grace. When I lived in Colorado years ago, a friend convinced me to participate in a sprint triathlon. For months, we trained together for the race, and when the day came, I felt prepared. Swimming was my strongest event, and I got out of the water feeling good. I hopped on my bike and headed out. The bike ride in this race wasn't very interesting. Seven and a half miles out the highway in one direction and then back again. But when I got out onto the road, I couldn't believe how good I felt. Not just strong, but fast. Clearly, all that training had paid off. I was a little surprised because really, I'm not that athletic, but I owned this race. Before I knew it, it was time to turn around and come back. Only then did I realize that what I thought was hard work and natural ability was in fact a very strong wind that had been at my back and was now fighting me mightily in the other direction. What happens to Jonah at the end of his book when the plant giving him shade withers and he feels the effects of the sun and hot wind, 
It's a perfect example of someone fighting against the current of God's mercy and grace. Jonah is convinced that the Ninevites should never be on the receiving end of God's mercy, and he is equally convinced that he deserves whatever blessings God offers him. He is caught in this cycle of judgment and condemnation, struggling to extend to his enemies the same grace God has offered him. It's a pattern of judgment we all get caught up in. We judge ourselves worthy or unworthy in spite of evidence to the contrary. We judge others, too, by their appearance, their achievements, or lack thereof, failing to see the many, many factors that contribute to their success or failure. We become trapped in a cycle of judgment, unable to extend compassion, empathy, or love. There's a story in the Gospel of John. Jesus is teaching in the temple when a group of religious leaders bring a disgraced woman before Jesus to test his knowledge of the law and his willingness to enforce it. These men are buoyed up by the currents of culture and privilege. After all, if the woman they brought to Jesus was indeed caught in the act of adultery, as they claimed, then somewhere there was also a man caught in the act as well. But Jesus refuses to get drawn into a discussion about law, and he refuses to condemn the woman. Here and throughout his ministry, Jesus keeps trying to teach us the same thing God tried to teach Jonah. God is not transactional. God is not obsessed with right and wrong, guilt and punishment, success and rewards. God is obsessed with loving us just as we are, because God is relentlessly relational. Time and again, particularly with those on the margins who've spent their whole lives fighting invisible currents of prejudice, Jesus sets aside judgment and shows us what it looks like to choose compassion. Father Gregory Boyle once said, the measure of our compassion lies in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with each other, with the folks who are on the margins. For there is an idea that has taken root in the world that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. To move past this idea that some lives matter less than others, Boyle suggests service. When we serve another, he says, we move toward experiencing the kind of compassion that can stand in awe of what another person has to carry, rather than standing in judgment of how they carry it. Service frees us for compassion because it puts us in relationship with those we are more likely to judge, enabling us to, as the poet Wendell Berry puts it, imagine lives that aren't ours. When Jonah finally goes to Nineveh after his time in the belly of the whale, he simply walks a straight line through the city, preaches his seven-word sermon, and leaves. He does not stop to learn anything about who the Ninevites are. He interacts not at all with the people who live there. And as a result, he has no capacity to imagine their lives or empathize with their challenges. That is not service. That is not relationship. And so Jonah remains trapped in ignorance and judgment. At the 2016 Oscars, Lady Gaga performed the song, Till It Happens to You, from a documentary about sexual assault on college campuses. The lyrics are, till it happens to you, you don't know how I feel. Till it happens to you, you won't know. It won't be real. On the one hand, the song is exactly right. How can we ever truly know the nature of another person's experience? 
especially if it is a horrific, traumatic experience we haven't had. On the other hand, in order to faithfully follow a relentlessly relational God, we're going to have to find ways to feel and show compassion for people whose experience is not our own, for people we may never fully understand. Compassion comes when we set aside judgment and focus on what we have in common, our God-given identity as beloved children who have discovered in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we are beloved not because of who we are or what we have done, but simply because we belong to God, and God chooses love. God chooses to love even Jonah in his petulant anger, even the religious authorities with their unjust accusations, even the Ninevites who persistently violate God's ways. God chooses to love even us, even when our ignorance and our rush to judgment prevents us from showing love and compassion to those who need it most. And it is God's love, love most fully revealed in the Incarnation, when God decided to put God's own self in the human experience. It is in that love that the soul finds its worth. It is not our actions or our piety that confers worth or value. It is the fact that God created us. God calls us God's own. God loves us no matter what. Enough to be with us as one of us, without judgment or condition. In a letter to Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton wrote, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. And in fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy, if anything can. God is calling us to Nineveh, to that place and those people we cannot imagine are worthy of God's love or our time. God calls us to love others with a kind of love that does not stop to ask whether they are deserving of it. We can run from that call or outright refuse it. But imagine what might happen if we dared to accept it. Amen. Thank you, for you are our God, and our God of our fathers and mothers forever. You are a refuge of our life, the shield of our help. From generation to generation, may we thank you and count your praises, evening, morning, and noon, for our lives which are committed into your hands, for our souls which are entrusted to you, for your miracles which are with us every day, for your wonders and goodness at all times. O oh, good one, your compassion does not fail. O oh, merciful one, your loving kindness never ceases. Forever we hope in you. And we ask that you pay special attention today and this week to Judy and Mark and Bob, Nancy, Dottie, Joan, Dale, Joe and family, Morgan, Jean, Lois, Paul, Marlene and Jim, Chris, Patty and Mike, Shirley, Sandra, Veronica, Wayne, Lee, Bill, Pat, Tina, Jim, Carol, Kay, Chip, Louise, Jason, Dan, Rudy, Brody, Katie, Anne Marie, and the family of Dale, Lance, our church and congregation, Tim, the United States and our leaders, 
and everyone dealing with the coronavirus. And now we pray the prayer that you gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
is faithful to all be with us all as we depart this blessed place. May we be blessing to every place we go until we gather again. Amen. Amen. Let this be.